captain of the French steamer Mary Louise watched the Italian steamer the SS Sirio get closer and closer to the shore with some concern. It grabbed his attention enough that he commented to his first mate that the Sirio was taking a dangerous course. He had hardly finished speaking when the Sirio suddenly stopped and the bow of the ship lifted. The Mary Louise changed her course. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the SS Sirio's dangerous course? Here we are. Enjoy! In March 1883, the Sirio had been launched from the R. Napier and Sons shipyard in Govan, Scotland. She was the first of three ships commissioned by the Societa Italiana di Transporti Maritimi Raggio and Company out of Genoa from Napier and Sons. The three ships were tailor-made for the company's service to South America, with an emphasis on immigrant quarters. In total, the Sirio had accommodations for 120 passengers in first and second class, but accommodations for 1,200 immigrant passengers. The Sirio's goal was speed rather than size, at 3,750 tons and with an intended speed of 15 knots. The Sirio's owners were soon in deep financial difficulties, however. In 1885, they sold their fleet of 12 ships, including the Sirio, to the Navigazione Generale Italiana Company, also known as NGI. NGI did not rename the Sirio and continued to have her serve a route that took immigrants to South America. By 1906, her route was Genoa to Barcelona, Cadiz, St. Vincent, Montevideo, and Buenos Aires. With the changing time, it seems as though the number of passengers she was supposed to be carrying had also been reduced, down to a total of 610. It would later be seen that Captain Piccione, the captain of the Sirio, was not a man who seems to have believed in such constraints, however. It was later claimed that where one child should sleep, there were four children, and that the captain allowed extra passengers to come on board for a hundred pesetas without adding them to the ship's official passenger list. When the Sirio left Genoa on August 2nd, her passenger list put the passengers on her at 570, and a crew of 127. The ship stopped at Barcelona and loaded even more passengers before continuing on his voyage. The ship's next stop was scheduled to be Cadiz, and this brought Captain Piccione to his dangerous course. The passengers were under the impression that Captain Piccione was in a hurry and attempting to shave off time from the voyage. Bringing the ship as close as possible to the rocks that surrounded the Hormigas Islands off of Cape Palos. Captain Piccione had made the voyage many times, and his familiarity had made him careless. At four in the afternoon of the 4th of August, the Sirio came to a shuddering stop on a rock right off of the Hormigas Islands. The ship had been traveling at full speed at the time of her impact, and the blow was sudden and powerful. Almost immediately, the Sirio began to sink, stern first, leaving no one on board any doubt about her condition and whether or not she could be saved. The reaction on board among the passengers and crew alike was one of immediate panic, with people stampeding to the bow of the ship since the stern was sinking. Anyone who fell in the push was trampled, while some people elected to simply jump off into the ocean as the safest option to escape the sinking ship. The first and second class passengers did not have much of a chance to save themselves. Their cabins were among the first things to flood, and the ship was sinking quickly. The crew and the passengers would point fingers at one another later as to who had turned to violence in the scramble for the lifeboats. The crew would claim that the Italian immigrants had outnumbered them, and as the ship had begun to sink, the passengers had taken the mastery of the ship. The crew would claim that they had lost control over the ship almost immediately. The passengers would tell a different story, 
they would say that there had been time to launch boats and distribute life belts, but that the officers and crew had abandoned the ship immediately, which had been when panic in the passengers had set in. The crew would say that the passengers had been armed with pistols and knives, and that it had become a bloody battle for the lifeboats that the crew did not feel powerful enough to prevent. On the other hand, some of the passengers would assert that the officers and crew had been armed with knives and revolvers, fought their way through the passengers, and that they had taken the first pick of the lifebelts and lifeboats. It only took minutes for the studio to sink, and piecing together an exact timeline of what followed the ship striking the rock is almost impossible. The French ship, the Mary Louise, which was already heading in the Sirio's direction, reported that they heard a large explosion as the boilers of the Sirio exploded when the cold water reached them. There were soon bodies in the water around them. The Sirio also began to break in half, causing even more panic for those who found themselves still on board the immigrant ship. As with most immigrant ships, the Sirio was carrying many families, who were now struggling to find a way to survive. Their stories capture the situation on the Sirio once the officers and crew had abandoned the passengers. Though there is no doubt that some of the passengers behaved very badly in the scramble for boats and lifebelts, there were also mentions of great humanity. A man named Carol Venturini saved the lives of his three sons and twelve other passengers, though it is not stated how he did so. His 18-year-old daughter rescued two children who were separated from their parents. Brigida Morelli, who was on her honeymoon, was in her cabin with her husband when the ship struck the rock. When the boiler exploded, it threw them from their cabin into the sea. Someone on the ship tossed them a rope, which they caught a hold of and clung to. Brigida could not say what happened to her husband, though, as they struggled to cling on to one another and the rope. A young woman who was traveling with her baby was advised to abandon her child to save her own life once they found themselves in the water. She said that she would prefer to go down together with her child, and her determination was rewarded when they were both pulled from the water safe and sound. The Austrian consul to Rio de Janeiro found himself in the water wearing a life belt, but seeing a woman and child near him without any means to keep them afloat, he surrendered his belt to them. He was sure he was going to go under, but was pulled from the water in time. The Bishop of Sao Paulo went down on the ship willingly, choosing to remain and bless the passengers that surrounded him. The prior of the British Benedictine friars also made no attempt to leave the ship. Instead, kneeling to pray, an act that he was still engaged in even as he went below the waves. A baby that had been floating alone on the surface of the sea was plucked from the waves and brought to safety. This was not to suggest that everyone behaved so well out of the passengers. People were witnessed fighting with knives over the remaining lifebelts and lifeboats after the crew had left. In at least one case, a group of women with lifebelts were attacked by a group of men who snatched lifebelts from them. Once people were in the water, people who attempted to grab a hold of boats were beaten off with oars and fists, as the people on them were afraid that the small vessels would be overwhelmed by the people who were trying desperately to climb on board of them. The people in the water were not without aid, however. The Mary Louise was the closest at hand, and as soon as she was close enough, she launched a boat which was able to save 25 people. These people were landed on the Hormigas Islands, while the Mary Louise picked up 25 more people and carried them to Alcante, which was the ship's next destination. For those that the Mary Louise was not able to rescue, help was still at hand. As soon as the Sirio had struck, every fishing vessel in the area had also begun to head in their direction. The Hoven Pigel came up alongside the Sirio, and with ropes, attached the two ships together. The rapidly sinking Sirio quickly threatened to drag the Hoven Miguel down with her, which alarmed the crew, but the captain was unmoved. Pulling out his revolver, the captain informed his crew that 
So long as there is a person to be saved, we do not move from here. In total, the Joven Miguel was able to remove 300 people from the sitio, though the Joven Miguel's danger was not over, even once they had disconnected from the sinking sitio. The people who were removed from the sitio all wanted to remain on the deck and refused to go below, something that put the ship in danger of capsizing since the ballast she was carrying had not been intended to balance that level of top weight. The captain was forced to resort to his revolver again, this time to drive the frightened survivors below so that his ship would not join the sitio at the bottom of the sea. He was able to bring his ship and all aboard safely into Cape Palos. The steam-powered fishing vessel, the Vicentia Lecano, also rushed to the scene, and they were able to rescue 200 people, while smaller vessels did their share as well. One lone fisherman, who was manning his small boat himself, managed to rescue 12. Some of the fishermen who rushed to help were themselves victims as panicked people in the water rushed their boats, and in some cases overturned them. In total, the local fishermen were credited with having saved 580 people from the sinking sitio. In the scramble to save as many people as possible, and the chaos of the sinking ship, many families were separated, and it was hard to tell once they reached the shore who had survived, and if they had, which port they had been brought to. Many children who were brought to shore were placed in the Cape Palos Foundling Asylum, with the hope that their families had survived and would come find them. There were certain tearful reunions. The physician of the SS studio had been separated from his wife and children, and he had imagined that they had gone down with the ship. When he was reunited with the family he thought he had lost, the newspapers described the event as joyous and tearful. Many of the passengers who did reach land refused to continue their voyage to South America announcing instead that they would return home, this time by land. The initial reports were kind to the crew and officers. There was a wide-held belief that the passengers had behaved in the worst way possible and that the crew and officers had been overpowered. A very large emphasis was placed on the nationality of the majority of the passengers, feeding into an already existing anti-Italian sentiment that existed in parts of the world. The papers would not be kind to the captain and the crew for long, however, once the passengers began to tell their stories. It was hard to think well of a crew that had abandoned their posts immediately. It was initially reported that Captain Piccione, faced with a ship that was sinking and that had descended into chaos, had chosen to end it all on the deck of his ship. It was soon being alleged by the passengers that the chaos on board was fault of the crew abandoning them to their own devices as soon as the ship began to sink and that the crew had fought their way through the passengers to save themselves. The total number lost was placed between two and three hundred, and very few of the 127 crew members were among them. The main victims of the tragedy had been the passengers that they were supposed to be responsible for. Captain Piccione, far from having died on the deck of his ship, had dropped into one of the ship boats, saying, He who can save himself. It was discovered that his ship's officers had told the story of his death to protect him until he could reach a safe place. Captain Piccione was to be disappointed if he thought that he would be safe once he was on shore, though. It did not take long for both newspapers and official inquiries to reach him. Captain Piccione did admit that he felt as though the wreck had been a result of him feeling too confident along the dangerous coast, though he was also quick to insist that the rock that he had struck was an uncharted one. Perhaps he thought that if he had made such a statement, no one would dig any further. But with such a serious accident, a full inquiry was to follow, with full public interest. It was soon asserted by newspapers around the world that the reason for Captain Piccione traveling so close to the shore was not to cut off time from the journey, but rather because he was engaged in the clandestine loading of Spanish immigrants from the coast aboard his ship. 
public sentiment, which was already turning against the captain and the crew with the statements of the passengers, grew to a higher pitch with these discoveries. Ships of an equal draught to the Sirio never took the course the Captain Pichone had chosen, and for good reason. The idea that a desire for greater profit had given the captain to risk so many lives was a matter of public outrage. The official inquiry by the Spanish government was equally harsh. The inquiry placed official condemnation on the captain and crew for having abandoned the ship and passengers to fend for themselves, and announced that the Spanish government felt they were responsible for the disaster that had followed. Some months after the Sirio had sank, divers ventured down to the Sirio with the intention of retrieving the treasure box that had been on board of the Sirio when she had gone down. With so many people on board who were intending to start a new life in a new country, it was expected that the treasure box was full of valuables that made it worth the salvage attempt. The treasure box was found and retrieved, but when they opened it, they found that the jewelry cases that the passengers had stored in it were all empty. It was alleged that when the Sirio had struck, at least some of the ship's officers must have chosen to take the time to pilfer what they could from the box rather than aid in the evacuation of the ship. Half a year after the sinking of the Sirio, it was reported in the papers that Captain Piccione had died in Genoa the cause of his death being given as a broken heart. If he did feel sorrow and remorse at what had occurred, he was not alone. At least one man, it was said, had lost all of his reason after he had lost his entire family in the wreck. A song would be written about the disaster in Italy, its lyrics speaking of the pain of the parents who had lost their children when the ship went down. For more information, please see the article Sirio's Disaster in the Warwick Examiner and Times from September 22, 1906, or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.